Hello, everyone. Uh, there in LinkedIn land, uh, and welcome to uh, Ascendum's AI in the Enterprise series. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, creating an AI center of excellence. And I am Polly Anthony. I'm the head of marketing here at Ascendum Solutions, coming to you from Cincinnati, Ohio. And I am joined by Uday Ayugari. He's our VP of AI strategy and innovation, coming us from the Sacramento Bay Area. Um, welcome, Uday. Thank you, Polly. Glad to be uh, here. Yeah, just to give this um, this a little bit of context. So throughout the um, year, I've been seeing so many requests for proposals, requests for information on creating centers of excellence for artificial intelligence um, from Fortune 1000 companies all the way to, to government agencies and city mun municipalities. So it seems like a lot of people are looking for advice on this. So I went to Uday and said, hey, Uday, can you help me? understand you know what an ai center of excellence is and he provided me just, just a ton of information just a wealth of it so i thought it was really interesting and I, so i consolidated it down to like a, a real high level presentation so that's what we're going to be going over today and i asked uday if you would you know explain some of the, the key points in the presentation to everyone here today and he graciously uh, agreed to do so um, just one quick note that if you um, have any questions please put them in the comments section of this page and we'll try to address them at the end of uh, the presentation. So with that, let's uh, jump right in and get into it. And again, thanks for joining us. So in your expertise, Uday, why, uh, what is an AI center of excellence and why is it important to establish this before going on any AI journey as a, as a company? Sure, Paul, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for pulling this together and I uh, really appreciate uh, working with you. And then I could really relate to all the RFIs and RFPs that we've responded and helped a lot of private and public organizations put uh, AI centers of excellence. So yeah, right topic, AI is at the cutting edge and uh, a lot of companies are trying to do AI, bring AI into their uh, four walls, so to speak. Uh, so yeah, what is an AI center of excellence? I would, I would call it as a center of your, your nerve center for all your AI strategies within your organization, right? So it's specifically designed to centralize all your efforts and bring together or rather create new AI assets uh, and all the adjacent technologies because AI doesn't live by itself in a, in a silo, but it is, uh, exists in, within an ecosystem of data competencies, data expertise, and so on and so forth. So basically an AI center of excellence is a well-organized uh, centralized function. Uh, well, I will talk about the centralized part a little bit, but uh, it's responsible for creating your AI assets. And we can go over that in a little bit. Uh, so that the overall objective is to really put, uh, like, you know, propel your organization as an AI first company, leveraging the some of the benefits that AI has to offer to almost every sphere of business. So in that regard, I'll just uh leave it with one last point so i refer to the organization assets right so what are those these are basically methodologies or frameworks at the very minimum you got a set of playbooks uh if the business encounters a specific uh, situation like hacks are pretty common these days uh, Cybersecurity is one i'm just giving one is such example how do you leverage ai to quickly resolve those kind of situations so these are uh, more uh, so these are some specific examples so how does the coe really power your teams out there on the field to really be able to address and respond to, uh, to these situations and then you got accelerators like we you know very well all the accelerators and the solutions that we've been working on and uh, the objective is to really make a mark in the field of innovation and technology and be four steps ahead of the market. Well, not so much of the market, but at least whatever your current capability is as an organization, how do you really lead the way as a beacon to uh, guide the entire organization, almost all the functions within the organization uh, so that you can solve some nagging business problems that can be addressed via driven solutions and so on and so forth. But yeah, that's, uh, that's what an uh, AI organization is all about. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so, uh, part of the information you gave me and, and what I saw a lot of people were looking in for information on is 
what does a typical AI COE organization look like? You know, what what is it composed of in terms of processes as our team? And you provided me with a bunch of information. I kind of consolidated it down to the inside, uh, outside in view, and then view within the organization. So could you please explain some of that concept to me? Yeah, sure. I'm just having a little bit of my little uh, jump of my screens here. Sorry, I can't see you. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, you're fine. OK, yeah, when it had to happen. Uh, so yeah, so the question is really about, uh, if you don't mind, I just kind of uh, lost the I lost the audio for a little bit. Can you repeat the question, please? Oh, sure. Just what does a typical AICOE organization look like? And you, I consolidated a lot of your points into this chart here. And if you could just explain it. Got it. Right. Uh, so essentially, an AI organization is uh, has two different views, right? So basically, an AI organization, let's uh, talk about when you talk about a center of excellence, so it has to be a nimble organization that can really swivel very fast and be responsive to your overall market demands, your competitive demands, maintain a competitive positioning in your industry, and also be able to bring in a lot of the good stuff that's happening in the innovation, the technology space, and bring it in. So in that, uh, in that respect, if you think about it, it's essentially a bridge between your AI potential. And I, I use the word mm -hmm. potential because something that you still haven't achieved, but you want to achieve. It's a North Star that you're following driven by AI technologies, right? And what are the practical applications and where are you currently? So in that, uh, and it's obviously, it's got a set of offerings, both strategic and direction and hands-on expertise as well. So when you talk about a COE, you got some very seasoned sets of professionals, both from the business side who have deep knowledge about the business processes, better than the organizations that are actually in that industry itself. Uh, by purely by way of cross pollination uh, for professional services, because you get to, you have the opportunity to really pick up the best practices from across the entire companies and organizations, and you're in a better position to kind of uh, be in a as a trusted advisor. Uh, so deep business process and industry expertise, as well as a set of very senior programmers and designers and data scientists and uh, data engineers and so on and so forth. So this is the basically DNA of a COE where the objective true is essentially to, uh, as your as the slide says, right, uh, what you ca clearly captured out here is you need to have a centralized AI effort. And that's the, that goes with the saying, uh, with the name, it's a center of excellence. Ideally, you won't have it centralized, but again, it depends upon the company. There's no hard and fast rule at that. What I've seen based on my experience is depending upon the size of the company, there could be different pockets of excellence. But again, you need to have a central body, which is, maintaining the budget, maintaining the return investment and all the other metrics, which I'm sure you're going to touch upon. Uh, so you need to have a centralized uh, function, which kind of brings together all the uh, information and the, all the great things that are happening across the company uh, and, and like in a kind of centralizes the effort. The second point, this pillar that you point, uh, point out rightly is the collaboration piece. Now, a center of excellence, uh, if you think about it and step back and uh, tell me of any one single sphere within your organization that is not touched by AI, uh, that would be very interesting. All right. So in a sense, what I'm saying is your HR, your legal, your recruitment processes, your finance, your FinOps, uh, your engineering, your uh, information systems, everything, not necessarily the technology sphere of your, uh, of your company, but every sphere, your sales, uh, and so on. The list is endless. Every line of business, every business unit is touched by AI, right? So that's a table stake. There's no argument there. But as a center of excellence, when you bring all these capabilities, you want to have a, a single, consistent, unified uh, approach towards solving any kind of business problems at a very broad level speaking. So collaboration is absolutely essential so that you basically be that uh, a little profit within the company, so to speak, if I, if I can use a word to really take cross pollinate all the best practice across the company and overall improve the level of, um, uh, of the maturity model for your overall organization. So collaboration is absolutely important. The third uh, aspect is uh, ensure governance. I mean, the governance and efficiency, right? So governance, the there's not, you, you can't talk enough about it. I mean, governance is absolutely essential. It's very specific to the, the state of technology that we live in today. 
Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, almost every sphere, the, the volumes of data and the order of magnitude of efficiencies and the metrics that you're accomplishing uh, through uh, through these technologies is mind boggling. It's simply overwhelming to say the least, right? So it's very important and it's very easy also to kind of lose control of the outputs that these ML models are recommending to you, right? So if you think about it, there are different aspects to the governance and we can talk about the governance piece in a little bit, but it's very essential as a leader in the company that you are accountable and you hold the entire organization to uh, uh, like, you know, in a, in a full spirit of transparency uh, when it comes to compliance and regulations and such, right? So governance is absolutely essential and uh, we can double index on that a little bit and efficiency. That's the whole purpose of being right. I mean, whether it's a top line growth, a bottom line growth, or you're trying to uh, address some operational metrics like cycle time reduction or capacity utilization or better use of your resources and skills. Uh, so all those are, uh, are perfect candidates for AI to impact and the use cases are abundant. So uh, yeah, I mean, you need to have essential governance frameworks and uh, with like, you know, there's a podcast that I gave very recently purely on the governance aspect. So um, there you go. These well, are that's, the that, that's a great segue because uh, that was my the, the next a question we hear a lot about governance you know and it seems to be essential but um you know what does those frameworks look like i and you gave me a whole lot of information i kind of boiled them down to these four points and if you, if you just address those and why is government so governance so important and what are what needs to be done to to make sure, sure. governance is enforced yes absolutely governance yeah uh, governance needs to be enforced uh, so let's let's step back and think about what uh, governance object. What's the objective of uh, having a strong AI governance? Uh, the idea is to ensure compliance, data privacy loss, fairness, and transparency across all your AI deployments. So, as a center of excellence, once you're in a higher level of maturity curve, you would be spinning out solutions which are purely reliant on AI. Uh, like nobody's business, right? So when you have that level of throughput from your AI center of excellence, again, it just uh, comes back to my earlier point, you need to have the right knobs and controls in your hands so that you are able to cater or configure your solutions and products to the specific governance and regulation requirements for uh, for the context. What I mean by the context is uh, you have industry specific uh, regulations, like for example, manufacturing has OSHA, uh, you got financial services, which has PII and PCI for financial transactions. You got FINRA, you got uh, federal regulations coming from the SEC. Uh, so those, and then um, healthcare has HIPAA. Uh, how can you forget that? Uh, healthcare has HIPAA, PII, and so on and so forth. So the list is endless. Uh, so that's on the uh, government imposed. And in fact, this morning, uh, Biden re released uh, AI Governance Act again. So it's it's a very relevant topic for the uh, webinar that we're having today on governance alone. Uh, so uh, there are four, these four pillars that you have very well captured on the screen, which is uh, the compliance, fairness, transparency, and governance, right? So what is compliance? It's basically in a short definition, it's an adherence to legal and regulatory requirements, the ones that I mentioned just now, related to how you ingest the data, how do you, how do you bring in the data, how do you publish it, what kind of security policies have, that have to be enforced, what's, what kind of privacy in AI applications that you enforce. And again, the, the ones that I mentioned to you were just basically the industry regulations, but then these regulations vary based on your geographical location also. Europe has is very severe on GDPR, almost to a point that, like you know, it's severely inhibiting innovation. But that's a different topic because there's a you got to strike a balance between how much of uh, innovation and governance uh, have to be imposed. But that's a larger topic beyond uh, your COE, so I'll I will I prefer not to index on that. So yeah, as a, as a, from a compliance standpoint, healthcare companies have uh, AI-based patient data and analytical tools, right, which comply with HIPAA and regulations for privacy. So that's an example for compliance. Fairness is, uh, is another critical cornerstone for all your AI products, especially if you're, uh, yeah, I'll give you an example in the financial services. That's what's ringing in my mind. But then essentially what fairness means is it's inclusivity by eliminating biases of your AI algorithms by ensuring decision is kind of fair and equitable and unbiased, right? 
So coming to the example in a fin uh, financial service, we are actually working on a uh, on a prototype uh, and, a, and a POC and, and, and actually a solution rather. Uh, this is in the financial services firm, which implements, let's say, fairness checks have to be implemented for AI loan approvals. As an example, there are uh, these approval models that prevent biased decisions based on the race and gender. So just to kind of uh, expand on that particular point, if a loan applicant is denied a loan, you got to be able to trace, I mean, as a leader for that uh, for, for that company that is assist, uh, taking assistance from AI-driven technologies for these recommendation models, you can just say that, yeah, we got a black box, an ML model that basically spins out all these recommendations. We don't know exactly what's going on out there. That would not fly too far, right? So you need to have accountability so that all these uh, uh, like you know decisions that are coming out of your ML models and such are thoroughly uh, like you know it's it's uh, viewable and it's transparent which actually brings me to the third uh, pillar which is transparency so uh, the classic definition for that again is it ensures that your AI processes and decisions are clear they are traceable and uh, they can be explained to all your stakeholders. So again, goes back to my earlier example of being able to explain why a loan has been rejected by your ML model, because at that point, ML doesn't matter. It's basically the person who needs to defend the actions of what the ML is doing for you. So since that is clear, the fourth and last bullet is again, implementing policies through governance, and you need to have a very robust oversight mechanism to ensure that uh, you, in, uh, like you know basically deploy the right level of controls for all your ai activities within the organization and uh, again there are a lot of frameworks which go along uh, in this space much of those could be process related where a set of non technology board of directors could enforce these governance requirements and on the technical side there are companies like google amazon and uh, all these companies that are rolling out large language models like mistral langchain and all they have a, an inbuilt way of sifting through the code that you uh, deploy and identifying if there are any vulnerabilities inherent uh, within the code that you that you put out there. It's called algorithmic bias and machine bias and so on and so forth. Algorithmic fairness, sorry, I take that back. So yeah, there you go. So uh, that is how uh, you enforce governance to create a, an AI COE. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so. I put together kind of a chart that kind of summarizes uh, the core elements uh, of establishing, but not only establishing, but it's sustaining, uh, you know, a successful uh, center of excellence in artificial intelligence. And I was hoping that you could just address some of the some of the key uh, points yeah. in, in this chart. Yeah, yeah sure. So, uh, Paul, uh, your coe is a strategic function i think that's pretty clear by now i mean it's an investment that you consciously made if you want to call yourself an ai first company almost every transaction that goes out of the door of your organization must be ai vetted right mm -hmm. uh, so it's a strategic function which is designed to maximize the impact of ai initiatives across your organization so that said to achieve this the ai coe is built around these five pillars that you mentioned here, which is basically what is the objective? You got to be very clear about your objective. Otherwise, it's just like you know, another academic exercise, which is kind of doing some innovations, but those are not coming to practicality, right? So you need to have those objectives tied with metrics, and it's very easy to find out which are your key metrics, L1, L2, or how you have organized your metrics. But where do you want to start from? In the former company that I was at, it was very well articulated by our leader. He called it the VSE, the Vision, Strategy, and Alignment. What is a vision? So, for example, if you have FedEx or UPS, I'm just taking an example of a logistics company. A logistics COE can set an objective to reduce the delivery times of 15%. And 15% is a very high objective, depending, uh, like you know, given the scale of these companies that I mentioned just now. So the uh, the goal, how they achieve. This 15% is by using real-time routing optimization, capacity utilization, doing predictive maintenance for their vehicle fleet. Just an example, right? But the metric needs to be there. It doesn't have to be carved in, in stone, but at least you have a goal. Either you overachieve or underachieve, and that helps you to calibrate as you move forward. So you must have an objective. You must have, as a product company, have some metrics that you want to chase after. And 
based on the the senior resources and the board of directors and all the folks that who are involved in making decisions for what the CIO, COE's objective is, you can sit together and then look at a reasonable metric. So that's the objective part. Uh, team is obviously the competency that you want to build. Either you want to build it or buy it. And what I mean by buy is basically you, you can make some strategic partnerships. You don't have to do everything because you cannot be doing everything and be good at everything, right? So you just need to uh, identify what is core versus context and make some strategic inv investments in your talent. So hiring and retaining top AI talent who are skilled for model development, model deployment, people who are very visionary can basically bring up a set of products which have not existed there before. Basically what I'm saying is people who have been in the industry for a while and who can identify patterns without a benchmark Right. So they basically go and create the benchmark. So these are all senior resources. Uh, so that's the team pillar that you mentioned. Governance. I think I don't want to uh, be spoken enough, but we'll come back to that if required. Innovation and business and alignment are the last two pillars, I believe. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what you have on, on the Pentagon out there. Very well organized. Uh, the team, you need to uh, build teams with strong AI and uh, domain specific uh, expertise. Uh, and these will be the catalysts for you to really drive your AI initiatives effectively. And they've been, I mean, given the, the, the technology itself, it's relatively nascent. Gen AI has been in actual production for about a year, even though it was out in consumer uh, public availability or general availability sometime in 23 or two years back, rather. So these are nascent uh, like uh, technologies. So the challenge always is you don't have too much of a benchmark. Right. But then guess what? If you wait too long for the benchmarks to happen, you will probably um, and become obsolete. So there's there is a sense of urgency that you must have when it comes to technologies like this. Uh, I will skip over the governance because we already uh, talked about the governance. But again, it's, it's establishing a robust framework to provide your oversight and enforce standards for your AI projects. Right. So that's the best definition that you can think of for governance. And that addresses both your regulations aspect which is very specific to your industry and a geographical location. It's at the crossroads of where you figure out. And not only that, all your customers. So if you're basically uh, manufacturing in Ohio, as an example, and then selling in New York or uh, California, these uh, they are local regulations, so which you have to ad adhere to, just as your sales tax is dictated by the point of sale, so on and so forth. Innovation is, again, uh, I think let's just index on this a little bit. The idea is to really foster a culture of AI first and continuous innovation. There are so many technologies that are coming, uh, like large language models, which really commoditize a lot of the high end capabilities, which are like a high end about a decade back. Right now, it's so easy. You've got computer vision analytics, which is like, you know, served as a service. You've just had to pull the API and be able to carve it so that it works for your specific business context. So similarly, there's NLP, there is uh, uh, industry specific large language models, which are highly trained in that specific industry's terminal in uh, semantics. For example, in the, I mean, I'm just giving you an example uh, in the financial services, a seven year arm for a mortgage loan cannot be, if given, uh, the arm is the key word here, right? So that can have a different connotation of use in a healthcare industry, right? So that's what I mean by semantics. Arm here is a period of time in financial services, whereas arm is actually body part in healthcare. So uh, you need to have very specific large language models for your industry, depending upon the use case that you're satisfying. Logistics industries follow a different uh, LLM, which have, again, specific terminologies. And if you were to put all these specific terminologies together, there are about, uh, about 20 to 30,000 terminologies put across all these LLMs, which uh, are a regular uh, part of your dictionary and your operations on a day-to-day -day basis. Business alignment is, again, all the AI initiatives have, have to find a way uh, to impact your business and find, uh, like, you know, quantifiable outcomes. So you must always be strategically aligned with your overall business goals and can be achieved in one day. So you need to have a roadmap towards uh, achieving some of the high end goals, start slow and then uh, basically have a way to ensure your maximum impact. So yeah, uh, that's that's uh, your way to measure and uh, and align your uh, AICOE for your business goals. Great, thank you. I think we have about five minutes left. So yeah. if you could briefly touch on, um, you, you sent me a lot of information on, on best ways to 
yeah. measure uh, the success of your of your center of excellence. And you gave me three or four points here. I just could briefly uh, talk about those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sure, uh, Paul. So uh, ROI, I mean, uh, I think we already covered this in various different forms in my responses, earlier responses. Uh, return investment is, is a way to, uh, without defining what ROI really is, uh, you got to have a, a quantifiable way of measuring all your investments, not just headcounts, but also the technologies and your, your uh, licenses and entitlements that you have for all the spend that you have. Uh, typically, uh, the spend on a COE uh, by some benchmarks, again, it varies from company to company, is about 5 to 10 percent of your overall technology spend in the company, right? Because you want to keep on innovating and the, this uh, in, uh, this uh, budget has actually increased over the last few years because the technologies that are enabling s several high-end business capabilities are coming out rapidly, right? So you want to really take the advantage of everything that's coming out there, if not everything, at least the ones that make sense to you. Uh, so yeah, ROI is, a, is a, you need to have the right frameworks and the machinery in place to be able to measure your returns on investment. Speed is another one which we haven't indexed much on the, in this conversation, which is we basically measure pretty similar to the enterprise architects, uh, we, uh, how you measure the output of an enterprise architect as an example. What is your time to market from the point you have a concept before it goes and hits the market viability and starts uh, like you know, gaining traction in the market? What's the time uh, spent on that? So that's the time to market. Time to value is another way of putting it. So you got speed as an essential uh, element. That's why you need to have the right mix of resources in your organization within the COE who can really bring all these aspects to life at a very short uh, turnaround time, right? And impact and outcome is another way of basically measuring what your outcome of all the initiatives that are AI initiated initiatives across the organization, so to speak, you got to have a measurable way of, uh, of really looking at the outcomes. Your program managers and your portfolio managers are, are there. That's their daytime job to do that. Impact is what you do in the long term for yourself, for your company, and mainly for the industry. Are you able to set benchmarks? That is when you can say that you are at a higher level of maturity as an AI first organization. So those are the four, four pillars. So from going from POC to production is a journey. And uh, you got all these metrics that kind of contribute towards uh, uh, towards how well you're organized in, in like, you know, traversing that whole path. Great. Well, that, that brings us to our last point. Um, you know, give us your tips from moving from an, you know, an AI proof of concept. You've got the team in place. You've got the processes in place. You've got approved on the budget. And we have two minutes left. What, what are the best tips? Uh, I can sure. all you down to these. So here you go. Yeah, we, we really want our audience to uh, get engaged. Perhaps we should have this for 40 minutes next time or maybe an hour. But yeah, so here goes. Um, see, uh, when you are everything starts with the concept right so in our company you know it very well we got like a big roster of uh, product backlogs across the industries and these are all high-end use cases that we've identified we launched thankfully uh, on several uh, of these pocs but the the journey starts from your concept to commit right so that's there are three phases okay let me start with that there are three phases to your overall poc to production the first is your concept which is something that we as a, co a co company and based on the ecosystem and the span, uh, the market scan that we perform, uh, we commit to a concept or a use case. Once a commit is done, there's no more looking back. You got to get into the commit to execute phase, right? You got to execute. No more questions asked because the concept is already done. The industry experts have weighed in and that's something that they can take to the market and sell. So we just had to get our heads down and then use LangChain, OpenAI, what have you. That's what all these experts are for and create a POC into a prototype. POC is an easier thing to do, but when you actually think about productionizing it, that's when the execution, the, the third phase comes, which is execution to market value, which is when you got all these different aspects to keep in mind. You got to have an infrastructure that, that is scalable because in the four, in your lab environment, you're probably doing it with a maximum of 50 users or hundred users, but when it goes and hits the market, you got uh, you got to think about scale, right? Not just infrastructure, but also how you're going to basically take the feedback from your market and then be able to process it and put enhancement requests and uh, turn it back around. Collaboration, I already talked about that. You got so many different business units and lines of business: HR, legal, FinOps, operations, uh, CTOs, organizations, CIOs, organizations. 
So all these have to basically come back to your COE as a dictionary or thesaurus to really launch their AI initiatives, respective AI initiatives. So collaboration is another aspect to it. Governance, well, the less said, the better. Uh, and then you got to, there are a lot of AI infused CI CD enablements that are happening, which is what uh, the fourth pillar is continuous deployment and integrations. So when you launch a product, it is not living by itself, right? There's so many interfaces, Salesforce, you got CRM applications, you got Zoho integrations. So all these systems put together, you need to have a, a good set of RESTful APIs, very well designed so that you can actually plug and play to the maximum extent possible and be able to reap the benefit out of it. Great, yeah, okay. Uh, I think that we filled a lot of information over a short period of time. Uh, and um, if you have any questions, you can uh, put them in the LinkedIn comment area. Um, I really appreciate you um, uh, uh, stopping by and watching our live stream. So I'll, I'll wait a moment. Um, if you have any additional questions you might have after this presentation is over, uh, you feel free to uh, send them to info at ascendum.com. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. And have a great day. See you.